Yeah, should be fine. Famous last words. Hold my beer and watch this. Hey everybody, John Grimsmo here. Welcome to the shop. Today we have some visitors. My sales rep from Elliot Matsura, Rick, and Tyler, a potential customer who's looking at getting one of these machines. So we figured we'd film the process and uh, get some really good answers out of here. So, this is my machine. Yeah, it's a beautiful <laughs> machine. So you're in the market, you make l l long pin things that are yep. super tight tolerance and like super tiny. Uh, not too dissimilar to what I make. You want to make them out of hard steel. Um, I want to make many of them as well. Many, I like the many. So they go from anywhere from 45 up to 60 thou in diameter. Uh, the harder the better and a smooth finish is pretty important. So. Um, and high volume obviously because we use hundreds of, or about 100,000 pins a year. So. 100,000 a year? Yeah. yeah, you can do that. Yeah, so yeah, I'm interested in checking out your machine and seeing how it operates. And Rick was saying right now the process is they sent out for grinding and all kinds of other like complicated stuff? Yep, yep. It's a multi-process uh, manufacturing right now. So we're hoping to eliminate that and go to a one operation uh, to a finished part. Yep. So. Excellent. It, and it looks like you have quite a bit of capabilities. Yeah, I mean, the, the parts that I'm making right now, they're uh, these are 125 thou, so they're eighth inch. Uh, there's a little step in the middle that's 128. These are made from 45 Rockwell 17-4 stainless, and I turn it in one pass, and the tools last for a very long time. And um, the cycle time roughly on that? 36 seconds on this, because I'm going for like the best finish ever. So I'm feeding yeah. it five tenths per tooth. Um, I could make it half that time if I didn't care so much about the finish, but I like pretty parts. And so can finish your chase look at on your part? Uh, not quite as nice as that. Right. But um, as long as it's not a coarse finish, I think we could get away with it. Okay. So we're probably looking at around a twenty to twenty five second cycle time per part. And if you're buying a hundred thousand of them a year, you'd probably have I'd say two shifts of capacity left at least. And there's nothing fancy on it, right? It's just turned, cut off, done, right? Yep. It's a small nose, a body, and then a head and a part. So, so, so you do have a lot more flexibility and capability for other components other than a very straightforward turning. So some of your uh, extra capacity could be used for making more complex parts than that. Yep. Yeah, that, that, do you make any parts that are longer so that you well, don't worry about any? Maybe you can show him the finished. Uh, yeah, yeah. Very nice. There's the finished pen. Oh, well. He has never seen it. Uh, we'll get to that. So, so when most of my parts are like tiny, like that little screw of that little pin, you know, this one inch long part's long for me. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, it's pretty nice. But on that, I wanted a really super good finish on the head. Yep. I want an amazing finish. Like, uh, like here to here, I don't really care about the finish, so I went kind of faster. And then here to here, I slowed it down like way slow, because that's where the three ball bearings um, grind on. Okay. So the better finish there, the better it feels as you're pushing that button. So I programmed it to go fast and then slow down right there and then slow. Okay. And it worked how you, amazing. How do you find the tolerance that it's able to hold? Once precision? it's warm, which only takes like 20 minutes, yep. it's holding a tenth or two. A tenth? Yeah. Okay. You have about five tenths of tolerance. Okay, you can do it. Like, you got to watch it. Yeah. Um, you can't just leave it for 24 hours and expect 100,000 parts to come out. But um, definitely. So it gets to a constant temperature that fast and only about 10, 15 minutes? Yep. Okay. okay. And uh, do you have, a, say you're running high volume, is there options to have cycle count for automatic tool Oh, yeah. yeah. Yes, there like is. For your tool light um, is? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'll show it to you here. So here for Tool Life, I've got Tool 120 is my main turning tool. It's made 698 parts. Right, right. I've got a life of 9999 because whatever. Uh, a warning at 1800, right. just so I don't forget about it. Right. So, so that if I replace the tool, I set that to zero. Yeah. I have to do it, and then yeah. So this will be the count that automatically changes to the next tool in your program. I haven't done sister tooling yet. Okay. There is a way. I just don't know. Um, but there's definitely a way. Okay. So after it hits life, it'll go, oh, I'm done. Move to the next one. 
Yeah, that would be uh, our machining is relatively simple, so yeah, it would just be a matter of the same. Oh, tool, if you had like four tools. turning tools, yep. you'd be you'd be done. Definitely. Yeah, it'd be awesome. And that's the capacity for your for your turning tools is four. Mm, I forget five. I think five on this side, three on the back side. Oh, okay. Okay. And uh, other than that, it's. I, I wouldn't. If you're making a good part with the tool that's almost worn out, I don't know if I would switch to the next tool without measuring parts. Just if you're trying to hold like a tenth, um, I would definitely want to baby that. But that's yeah. that's me and experience. You know, like with experience, you might find it's fine. Right. But no, we definitely have somebody monitoring it. And yeah, no, exactly. Parts. But like when I'm making parts, when it's running good, I'll probably and it's warm and happy. I'll check it every hour, okay. and then be like eh, one tenth. One tenth. Right. And and it's got it's got freaking uh, five digits, oh. and it listens to the last one. Wow. <laughs> so it's like you give yeah. it a half tenth offset, it listens. It makes your part half a tenth bigger. That's great. Yeah, so it's cool. And then of course, well, what we would do is we would because uh, your this is your benchmark part. We would just come and set up that job as part of your training at your facility. Sure. Okay. And then when Francois came and, and hooked me up, we programmed uh, this part, I think, as the first part because we want to see, you know, he wants to train us. So let's use a practical example. And your part's simple. So uh, you guys would just, you'd be done. Uh, and then if you, like you said, what's some of the capacity if you're looking for other work and something comes up and you need our support, we'll come and we'll come again and do it whenever you need it. So, so about your bar stock feeder, what's yep. the range you guys have right now for size? So, I, well, this is the G112, so I guess it goes up to 12 millimeter. So, okay. Um, I'm putting in 12.7, half inch sometimes, which is fine. Do you know what the range is? Off your head? Uh, I have it right here, actually, yeah. So, I think you can go down to, um, basically, you could go 13, okay. but that's with some prep, spindle prep, but 10 is basically standard. Okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I have the ranges of we'll the bar feeder. So you have to do that basically. You have to make it three eighths. Okay. Because uh, the way the collet in the bar feeder grips onto the material, mm -hmm. it's the outside of it has to fit through everything. Right. So if you had a half inch collet, the outside of the collet won't fit through um, okay. everything. So I had to. I wrote a little program and I had to prep all of these half inch bars to be able to fit the collet with the three eighths thing. So all I'm doing is I'm switching between a 3 8 bar collet and a quarter inch bar, bar collet. Between different materials? Because those are the two material right, sizes right. that okay. I run. Okay. So one millimeter up to 12.7 millimeters. Okay. So one mil is 40, what? 40 thou? Yeah, 39. Um, which is crazy. Yeah. That's so. about what we need. So. Yeah. But um, in terms of like that, if you're going to get almost like she's one size bar because what are your parts, but I mean. Yeah, I think we, well, we can play around with that. It depends on how you guys are going to process, like afterwards, and you don't have how much yeah. value for grinding. Right? Right. Yeah, I mean, if you're setting up one machine to basically make one part, guide bushing stays the same, bar feeder stays the same, you're just loading material and exactly. changing inserts. That's kind of a dream, actually. Yeah, yeah a single part, <laughs> like, a few different sizes. It, yes. You know, people always complain about Swiss lathes being uh, hard to set up, time consuming, it takes a whole day to set it up, whatever. And there's a lot of truth to that. Like, it, it can take a long time. Um, I'm becoming a lot more comfortable with it, a lot more knowledgeable, how to change all the tools, set all the offsets. Um, sometimes it's just a good experience to like do it a bunch of times. Um, now, what about the your, your, your cutting fluids? Is there, that did, on, on that selection process, what were you looking at and why did you select the, the blazer? I, I chose the blazer because that's what Tornos recommended. That's, I think, what you guys recommended. Yeah. Um, I'm relatively happy with it. QualiCam makes another really good product as well. And uh, yeah. Was that a concern because of oil and, you know, because I know that your other lathe over there, you're using uh, probably the other blazer synthetic? Uh, no, I'm using QualiCam. Oh, yeah, okay. Else. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, you need a good, good oil. Um, working with oil sucks, but. Yeah. <laughs> Familiar. Yeah. yeah. And the light? Like that. Oh. I don't know. The, the cool thing with, with coolant, it evaporates, like do you, have, do you have mills and other yep. lathes and stuff? So it evaporates, you're topping it up every couple days, whatever. With the oil, geez, I don't think I've added oil in months. That's great. That's nice. <laughs> it's getting low because part carry out and stuff. Okay. So, but, so it's all oil? Yeah. It's not coolant? Right. Okay. Which makes sense. 
Coolant is uh, frustrating. I'm so used to coolant that that's what I like better. And then you get into oil and like everything's oily. Yeah. And <laughs> you're always like up to your elbows and drops of oil. But, but yeah. Okay. And parts feed underneath into your Yeah, so let's too. open this up here. So you see the drips, just yep. everything drips yep. on you. But yeah, subspinal comes in, grabs it, spits it into this um, oh, chute. Okay. And then so there's a conveyor here. Bah, 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 bah. We invented that parts carousel, which is epic. That's pretty cool. So after X number of parts, it will rotate. You got your rotation right there. So when you're doing setup, one part at a time, you can walk away for a few minutes and be like, one, two, three, four. Ignore the first two or whatever, and then measure. See, the other weird thing with the Swiss is that um, if you're changing something on the sub side, then the very next part that comes off, you can measure the change. If you're changing something on the main side, you have to make two parts. Because the part, you, you make your change, you make the part, it switches to here, but another part comes out here. And then, so you have to kind of think that in mind, like you have to make two fake parts to test your change. And I've, I've made that mistake too. Like I make a change over there, I make one part, and I'm like, oh, it didn't change anything. But. Yeah, so I've got the 2000 PSI high pressure coolant with lines going to the drills. Uh, these lines here go into the turning tools. There's a suppression system on here too. Right? There is fire suppression. If you run oil, you need fire suppression. Okay. It was like, it was not that expensive. Is Thousand that bucks or something. The, it's in the quote. It's in the quote, yeah. Um, and thankfully I haven't had to use it yet. I have seen something spark up when I ran titanium with no coolant. So I was like, oh my gosh. Um, but yeah. Thank you very much. How do you find the life of the tools? Very good with the oil. Um, they're great. I'm still learning kind of the actual tool life, but I put it into that menu, and uh, you learn over time. Like when you think it's dead, you pull it out, look at it under the microscope, and be like, actually, that's not bad at all. I'm going to replace it anyway, but it, you know, up the life of the next one or whatever. I mean, inserts are what twelve bucks each or whatever. Yeah. Like. It's, it's not expensive. Uh, I mean, it adds up, but. So your live tool is there. Yep. Um, so you're running an operation on the back. You, you machine, part, your, you said the rear end? The rear end, front end? Uh, Subspindle. Subspindle, okay, so your subspindle picks it up. And how does it feed it into the live tools? I'll show you. The live tool spindle? Wrap your head around. Uh, yeah, like we have a CNC mill, okay. just a manual. So normally a lathe is like two axis or whatever, you know, in, out, up, down. Yep. Swiss is like completely bonkers weird. Um, I gotta be careful I don't bump into anything here, but. All right, so the X axis, both sides of the tool, so if like, the, if these are tools and these are tools, they go like that. So that's your X and then here's your Y. Can that entire oh, for sure. Because these are live tools up here. So I've got a little 30 thou end mill right there. Um, and you can put drills here and you can put more live tools up here. So yeah, you can travel all the way down. It's super capable. I actually plan to have uh, two of these horns, one mounted here, one mounted up here, to get more drills and stuff in there. And then for Z, the it's the material that moves out. Can that feed um, in and out as well? Not that we would necessarily need that, but you can feed out and then in again, or? So it's a guide bushing, right? So it's like, it's like a very tight fit with the bar going through it. And if you go, if you turn the diameter smaller and then you pull back, you'll, you'll lose it. So you gotta be careful about that. You can go in and out a little bit, for sure. Yeah, if you were machine to say squat or yep, something, yep. then you can kind of go back. Okay. And so sometimes you gotta um, you gotta manage your operations so that you do the front of the part first, and like finish the front of the part, and then move it out a little bit, and then do a little bit more, do it out. Um, so you gotta be careful like that. But it's cool because you can stage it, and the machine's so repeatable. Usually anything blends together really well. And then on the sub side, so on the control you got X1, Y1, Z1. Uh, I don't think there's a B actually. Oh, B would be like that extra. 
$40,000 option that nobody really needs in our industry. <laughs> um, medical uses it for sure. But, and then X4 will be this guy. And then Y4 is these guys up and down. So there's only the two rows of tools here. You got your static tools on the bottom, your, your driven tools at the okay. top. And they're daisy chained together, so like one spins clockwise, the next spins counterclockwise. And you got to plan that in your programming a little bit. Um, I've definitely broken tools and made bad parts, wondering why it's not working, because it's <laughs> spinning backwards the whole time. And then I also got this uh, 60,000 RPM Mayrat uh, electric spindle for running my 20,000 end mill. That's how we do the torques on the, on the parts. So this thing's sweet. It's absolutely silent, and it's, it's epic. And your machine's stainless too. Yeah, stainless wow. and titanium. That's all that we do. Um, yeah, and then Z on this is the spindle itself moving forward and back. So it feeds into the tools. Exactly, yeah. So the tools like present themselves, and then the thing goes like this, and then it goes drill, 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 machine, machine, machine. Yep. And then, uh, and it's, what's cool about it is, so we got the Nakamura. It's a very strong, very powerful, very heavy machine. It's got a big 12 position turret. And since we're doing all this fine like detail milling and stuff, it's a big heavy machine to like, to move tents rapidly. Yeah, yeah, this machine is so much faster and so much lighter that literally the exact same program feeds faster in those milling moves because it can just keep up. It can, it can move that fast. Um, so that's, I, I noticed that like right away. Cycle times were cut in half from that machine because it's, it's two machines in one. Yep. You're machining on the main, you're machining on the sub, everything's happening at the same time. I saw the capabilities of a part and it, it was incredible. Yeah. They made just a brass. You utilized every single tool and... I was impressed. Yeah, it's, it's sure cool. It's capable, so. And then in your position, either, like, I tooled it up. I got, you know, this option, which was 10,000 plus or whatever. Um, extra stuff, extra stuff, extra stuff. And I'm going to use most of it. You know, every now and then you buy something, you're like, maybe I shouldn't have gotten that. <laughs> but, um, but if you guys are tooling up, either you go super capable or you're like, we just need this. Yeah. Like, let's keep it simple, keep it cheap, um, get it done, make money, that's, you know? That's the idea. Okay, interesting. And then, for right, so, yeah. you could potentially have um, all stationary lathe tools in there yeah. instead of any live tools whatsoever. Right. Well, you have, there's 30 positions and you have 12 driven tools, right? Okay. And you got 10,000 RPM on those. Right. All comes with those, yep. Maybe you can spec it without, I'm not sure, because they just unbolt. Uh, this is permanent, comes with those. Okay. Those two are optional slash included. Right. Those empty spots is like these kind of guys. They just bolt right on and gives you more live tools this way. Um, so you're saying this, this is optional here? I don't know if it comes with or not, or if it is optional. It's right here. Uh, oh, okay, it just comes with both. Because I'm thinking, because we're only running basically one, uh, yeah. right. one so operation, we would want to stack. Redundant. You could, you could have redundant, you could just make backup redundant tooling. But yeah, for the turning play. tools, for yeah. sure. Right. Yep. I, so I don't know if these are like required to purchase or if they can be. Yeah, we can, we can see if uh, the, the machine that's in stock has all that on there yeah. now. But yeah. I, I think we could take some of those live tools out of the package too as well. Right. Okay. Yeah, so I mean, it's possible that we could use them for something. Mm -hmm. We do tooling well, well it's probably good to have a couple of them at least right yeah. and then um but you again you don't know what you're gonna be making with the other capacity so yeah. you know you know that the rule of thumb is when you say you know take it away then something <laughs> comes in the door and you yeah. need it right so exactly. the thing with rick though is anything's possible so don't be afraid <laughs> <Yeah>. to ask <laughs> well our applications team are pretty good so they yeah. they, they uh they'll work with you on, on getting it all ready and and you know even before he bought the nakamura like he basically almost virtually self-taught himself to run almost every machine in here and and this is a little bit more complex than more complex. Than, than, than than that yeah. mind you once it's set up that pain's done and then it's yeah. just repeatable so um but you know you have something in, everything's very near to the spindle that you can actually the contracticity of the parts much better on this because of the, the headstock design versus the chuck and for smaller components it's it can't compete it's two different animals you completely apart, did you? I did not. No. I always got to bring it apart. I know. We <laughs> actually, we were looking for one, but it was so small you could get, may have uh, fell in somewhere. And, and yeah. So we didn't find, we did bring one. We wanted to show you, so. Yeah, right. the, uh, 
what can I show you? So like, so if, if this is the part you're making, an exaggerated version, normally on a lathe, like on the Nakamura, you clamp it, you got all this material sticking out, you turn it, you turn it, you turn it, it deflects. There's, yeah, we could, there's no yeah, way we No can way make. you can do it, because your part's so yeah. skinny and so long. But yeah, with the guide bushing, it's just like feeding it, the tool stays right here the yep. whole time. Feed, 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 cut, 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 cut. And uh, I'm, I've just converted to guide bushing like a few weeks ago. Before that, I was running in chucker because my parts are so short anyway. Um, I'm really liking the guide bushing. It's, it's cool. It's different. Um, it's making really good parts. Guide bushing is just an additional layer of support, essentially, whereas yeah, your chuck so is just well, pushing you, parts. You're probably only going to be running one diameter bar, so you'll get to show you right there. Uh, this is your main spindle. I've unclamped it so I can go... So that's your main collet. Yep. It's just a regular collet, like, uh, let's see here. Aha. Mind if I take a picture? Yeah, absolutely. Take, take everything, yeah. Take video if you want to. So here we have a hard hardinge um, main collet, so that would go right there. It's the same type of collet that goes in the sub. And then the guide bushing, this has carbide pads on the inside. Okay. These are made in Switzerland because the ones hardinge cells don't fit on this machine. I made that mistake. <laughs> so uh, pretty easy to get through Switzerland, but they, the threads are different. Um, so this is the guide bushing, like I said, carbide on the inside. This has very little clamping range because it doesn't really clamp. It just adjusts and like ever so slightly um, pinches okay. until you, it matches your bar diameter. Right. And the trick that I've learned is there's a couple different ways to do this, but you adjust the tightness of that until you can barely push the bar through yourself. Oh, like put your hand on the front of the bar and go, yeah. and uh, with your tiny little needle sized bar, I'm not sure how you're going to figure that out, but without poking a hole right through your hand. But anyway, yeah, so it's a three call it system. So you got your main, your guide, and then your pickoff call it on the sub side. Um, but these aren't bad, they're like $100 each or less. I think these are only $50 each, these are 100 something. You only need a couple. Yep. Um, we make, I think, 14 different components here. So we need kind of to tool up and to have, you know, 20 different collets. But yeah, what that does, the main spindle clamps, it's gripping the bar, and now it's shoving it forward and backwards through the guide bushing. And then it automatically uh, retracts backwards based on the length of your part. So for your part, if it's two inches long, it'll open, it'll go back two inches, exactly. and then it's ready to make right. the next part. Okay. And access is really good. Like one thing, a big thing that I went with the Tornos over the Citizen or whatever else, first of all, because it's a left to right configuration, whereas Citizens are all right to left. Okay. I literally, I don't know if my brain could work that way. Um, because the Nakamura is, you know, the bar goes on this side, part comes out that side, a citizen is backwards, I don't know, that's weird. But also, there's a lot of tooling and access is really good because you're like literally like this, you know, yeah. in, in here all the time. Um, and I really appreciate that about the Tornos. And uh, yeah, and the LNS bar feeder's been great. What's the maximum length you can potentially machine? Well, I mean, you see how far we move back there. I think it's Travel. nine inches. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think it's good. Okay. It should be in the specs, but with the chucker mode, it's only about an inch, I think. Um, but with guide bushing, it's like nine or something. Because you just imagine like it's clamped and it's just pushing all that through the guide bushing. And your parts are that long. You should be able yeah, to eject them, eject them no problem from there. Um, I'll just throw them in there. Yeah. See, we also made, I made all these ejector okay. pins. So that's, that threads into the subspindle side. The collet goes around it. Your part ends up right here. And then when the part's finished at the chute, collet opens up. This guy, there's an air cylinder that goes oh, okay. and spits the part into the thing. So I had to make different diameters right. so that we could do diff our different parts, right? Okay. Um, it comes with like a, is this factory one in here? It comes with this one that I just ground down 
uh, until they fit my part. And then I figured, oh, I'll just make it. You can make it, yeah. yeah. And I made them out of titanium and anodized it blue because wow. why not? So I actually made these on the Nakamura and just dealt with the deflection and like programmed the deflection out of it and stuff. But yeah. Is there anything you had to really do to the machine after you purchased it? To Learn get it. it. To, yeah? Learn it. Like Learn it, it was a lot. Uh, I love it. Like I'm super nerd for all this stuff, so I'm right in it. Um, like operating it's pretty easy. Setting it up is more complicated. Programming it is more complicated. And understanding everything is yeah. most complicated. Um, so it's like layers of stuff. That's why shops have operators that are like pushing buttons and measuring parts. Yeah, exactly. But at the moment, like my guy Angelo knows a bit about it, but I need to take more time and teach him you know, how to fully run it. Um, and he can, of course. I just haven't gotten there yet. And. Uh, what programming software? We use Fusion 360. Fusion 360. Uh, you're still doing a lot of hand programming to make it work. Like you can't just program something and hit post and it'll run. I'm I'm close to there, but but with your part, it's simple. Like you you can hand code the whole thing and it wouldn't be that hard. Yeah, they're relatively simple. Yeah. But yeah, um, problems. Uh, well, like today. I'm, I'm prepping this thing was supposed to be running the whole time you're here. Uh, I don't know why. I made a bunch of parts this morning, and now it's just making one part at a time. And I'm like, did I push a button? I don't know. I must have done something Single stupid. Because it's like there's a button. Yeah. That button right there is like if it's on one part at a time, if it's off, it'll make multiples. And it's not making multiples. It's driving me nuts right now. Yeah. Do I see it operating? For sure. Oh, yeah. I can, I can make it do one part. So like a lot of times you're like, why won't you do what I want you to do? Well, and it's yeah, that's good. That's good. That's good. One thing I will say to you guys behind the camera is uh, when you're trying to show off, when you're trying to do something. Your brain's not firing on all cylinders because you're thinking about other stuff. So, especially on this machine, I gotta calm down. I gotta like make sure it's it's all good. I don't make a mistake. Um, yeah, should be fine. Famous last words: Hold my beer and watch this. Yes, you got machining happening on both sides, which is amazing. And then you can you have to switch rotation, or your tools are just offset the opposite direction. Um. The off offset, the tools are offset. So one's right side up, the other one's upside down. That way you're, you're efficient, right? Like you're always spinning the same way. It takes half a second or whatever to rotate. Like it's no big deal, but we're good. Transfer right now. It's got coolant through the sub spindle. So interesting thing, one part. Um, for parts you want to be pretty, the coolant through the sub spindle right before transfer, like you hear woo. Uh, cleans everything off and otherwise it'll smear there'll be chips that get everywhere it'll clamp it'll look dumb it'll be bad tolerance so that's I like that feature a lot like even if that's an option I don't know it just came that way but that's worth paying for um, just for the flushing I, I, I wish I had it on the Nakamura and I'm I don't feel like spending I know you can add it I don't, I don't feel like spending four thousand dollars right now not through the sub yeah. So it'll pick that up and physically eject it into the chute and then feed it out to yep. even that tiny little part. Yes, yeah, so you can see in the oh, sub spindle right yeah, now, yeah. there's a part right now. So it came and did a cham chamfer on the back of that? Yeah, so it, I've got one of my live tools right there, that long stick out one yep. closest to me. Um, I kind of crashed my facing tool yesterday or the other day. So I had to be creative and use my live tool to spin and face the end of the part off. Um, gotcha. But the cool thing is you can balance the two spindles. Like on your part, you might think you're fine with just parting it off and it's done. But it's, it's hanging out here for a few minutes doing nothing while, or a few seconds while the other part's turning. 
so why wouldn't you bring it over here and put a perfectly beautiful little face on it? Um, because you're, you're balancing the two spindles, right? If this spindle's doing nothing, you think to yourself, what can I put on this side to make it more efficient? It's giving me ideas. Right. And, th and that's what's Here's valuable why. for you right now, is to, uh, to get ideas, to think about it, see what I'm doing, see what other people are doing, and then your brain starts to fire and, yeah, you can serialize it. The one thing on this side, there isn't uh, radial live tools. So if you want to serialize around the outside or something, you can't on this side. You can only do it on the main oh, side. Op operating the machine is pretty easy. You, uh, you get into your machinist stance here. You go like this. Uh, the screen comes out, which is really nice. So usually I'll, I'll one finger over the stop button, one finger over the feed hold. And uh, if I run it and I turn the feed way down, then it does like feed and rapid at the same time. So you see the sub coming over really slow. I made it slower, 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 stop. Nothing happens right now. Or I can crank it up and get it to move. But it controls both sides. So now both sides are slowing down, okay. which is kind of weird. Okay, not independent. You can also, it's got your channel one, your main, and then your two is your sub. You can make them independent. Like I'll make a part next and we'll do just the sub side. So when you're testing, proving, not sure what's going on, that's super valuable. And uh, training will tell you that. You hear the sub, that's the sub coolant pump. Woo! So it grabs it, cuts it off, pulls it back. Makes only one part. Ah! <laughs> but if, so it's got two channels to code, right? Main spindle, sub spindle. And they are physically different. Yeah. So I will make adjustments here, but I like my computer code to match exactly. So if I make an adjustment here, I'll walk over there and change it. Or I'll change it only over there, bring it over here with a USB stick, and they got to match, right? Otherwise, you're asking for trouble. USB, you can connect it. I just haven't yet. Um, but if you hold both buttons for five seconds, three, four, five, and then you let go of one and leave the other on, now it's only going to run the sub side. So if we run it right now, the main's not going to do anything. It's going to ask me, oh, I got to go back to memory. Only doing the sub side. So if I'm watching it, I'm like, okay, I don't have to worry about that. Because there's so much stuff happening at one time. You have to be confident you know what's going on, right? Definitely. And then you got to stop it or else it's going to try to transfer a part. Been there before. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's very cool. Mist collectors, uh, a must. Absolutely, because the oil gets so smoky and misty that. Yeah. How much is that? A couple grand? It's like the must haves fire suppression, bar feeder. Mist collector, um, that's amazing. Yeah, and the, like I developed it, but my friend helped me make it. Like he did all the making yep. and all the brain work behind yeah. it. And he's going to be selling that system. That's so he'll want to know about you for sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we make a lot of them. So right. Need some way of organizing. It's super handy. Because yeah. especially a cold machine, the first uh, first 20 minutes of parts are all going to be slightly different. And then it's going to stabilize. And then you crank it to 25 or 50 or 100 and then you're like, just check every batch. And, and what I do is, usually 25 is a good number for me, 10 or 25, and then I'll make a bunch of bins, it might even fill it up. If I check the very last one that came out and it's good, they're all good. I don't have to check any of them. And I trust it and I believe it. Um, if the last part is really bad, then I start going backwards in time, bin by bin, and I realize, here's where it went bad, or here's where it just got out of tolerance, everything before that is good. So the machine is insanely consistent, which is fun. That's cool. Well, that's, uh, that's impressive. Yeah. That's a great system. Yeah, I'm loving it. I mean, like any machine of this class, it's, it's, uh, it's a lot of money. But you, you start to see what you're paying for. You're like, that's really, they thought about this. I mean, Tornos has been around for what, like a hundred years? Yes. Yeah. Like when I went there, 
they showed me 1850 Swiss lathes, literally. And he's like, we dug this one out of the river right there because somebody threw it away and we're restoring it right now. And uh, it started out as a couple different companies and there were like a couple different designers and different designs back in the mid 1800s. And then they came together and created Tornos, the brand. Because they're like, let's stop competing. We're all doing the same thing. Like, let's. That's yeah, it's cool. That's great. It's come with the light bar too. Right? It does come with the light bar. I really appreciate that. It's a very bright, white, spacious design, even with all the black everywhere. Um, some layers are dark, and it's it's a big difference. Lots of visibility. Not one of these little. Japanese windows. <laughs> um, yeah. High pressure coolant is, I don't want to call it a must, but it's great. Um, this is 2000 PSI chip blaster. I mean, you see the chips that are coming off now with this material. They're like small and they're breaking and some materials like when I'm making those buttons, they're very stringy because I'm doing a really heavy cut. This starts out as like 3 8 material. So I'm making a single pass. Like the depth of cut is about that deep. Um, and the chips really bird's nest and wrap around and stuff. And pause operation to clear those and then? Yeah, I mean, I'll make a couple hundred parts or whatever and then be like, man, it's really loading up in there. They kind of shove into weird places and stuff and I cut myself trying to remove them. <laughs> so use pliers or something. Oh, awesome. Very cool. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that pretty much answers my question. It's like every time I get a new machine and we grow and we want more, I'm like, would I get another one? Or would I get something else, something different, something better? I do think I'll get another one of these yeah. as we grow and make, need more pens because it's just good. I've learned it. I really like it. Um, so as we're going to be moving shop in the next couple of weeks, I'm trying to plan out, like, how would that shop fit three of these? <laughs> like, <laughs> let's lay it out just so I know. It's, it's not that big. No, it's, it's small. Yep. Footprint, I mean. Yeah, and the 26, like, you don't need the 26, but it's, it's this just, like, 20% bigger. Yeah. You know, it's the same thing. Um, we got the 6-foot bar feeder. You can also get the 12-foot. Um, I'm very happy with the 6-foot because especially with your noodle material, like imagine trying to move 12 feet of that, like it would suck. Um, it's possible, but it would be weird. So I don't know, you gotta weigh that. The, the cost is the exact same for a six foot or a 12 foot, which is silly, but whatever. Um, and I, I'm not fitting a 12 foot here, you know, so. There is a standard tool in There is, it's 300 PSI. So that's, uh, let's see if I can do it here. That's 300 PSI, regular coolant. There's a lot of ports, like I'm not even using the ones on top. Is it a water, look, was that the 1000 PSI that was coming directly out? Uh, it looked, like a it, it looked a different color only because of the pressure, pressure. 2000 PSI. Yeah. It's all the same system, all the same oil. There are filters, factory filters um, for this coolant and then other filters in the chip blaster for the 2000 PSI, and I just realized I have to check them all now because it's been a while. And any high pressure coolant system, we recommend a must as a mist collector, not just for your health, but actually it's, you don't want the machine to get contaminated where you don't want mist getting in areas where you don't want it, like the control and electric right? Makes sense. Yeah, at this, you see it's not very misty, but when, when you've got that coolant and it's like white because it's so volatile, um, it atomizes it, there's a total cloud inside here, and this does a good job of sucking it out. This one's actually got the three stages of filters. I've been working with them to develop like the perfect Swiss thing. It's got a HEPA filter on the top. Yeah, because typically when you go into a screw shop, you see like a haze on the top of the roof. Like a lot of those automatics, those Acme Gridleys and Davenports and stuff like that. It's, and it's, it, it is so slippery on the floor when you're walking those places. So we already ejected that part. It's going to come in and do nothing.
Yep, there's a couple leaks out the corners. So we just put those there every couple days. Um, we try to be really mindful of drips and stuff on the floor because it can get very slippery. Yep. Windex cleans it up really well. So from a 12 foot bar, you maximize this better, but I don't That's really right. care. Gotcha. Cool thing is we can now put this on the Nakamura and make more parts. Yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. Every end of the bar has to be chamfered so that it fits through the guide bushing and everything. With your... So you're having your supplier do the bar prep? Or I know, we're doing it here. Yeah. Yep, gotcha. yeah, we just grind it down. Okay. Great. Yeah. All right, man. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks for having me, John. Hopefully nice you learned you. something. I did. Thanks yeah. for letting me see your machine in action. Absolutely. That was great. If you have any questions. All right. And Rick will take good care of Thank you. Thank you, John, for all your help today. <laughs> Very informative. Makes my job easy. Thanks, sir. Thank you for coming. I appreciate it. You're welcome. It. Yeah. Great. Awesome. And I hope you guys learned something, too. This was fun for me to, like, gush about the machine. I've been meaning to do this video, so it's a good excuse to, yeah. to do it. <laughs>